gave to me. That is what they gave to you. In 22 years, they destroyed education and destroyed the means of true empowerment for the people. Education is the biggest uh, tool you can give to any child if you want them to succeed or fail in life. It depends on the type of education you give to them. For 22 years, eh, these people destroyed. This, this 50, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old uh, people in charge of Nigeria from local government to federal level, for 22 years, they destroyed healthcare. Today, eh, many, many of you are resorting to local help because, you know, you have none of a, a standard health care to take care of you. None. You know it. And if you have to go for one, at least at all, you know you can't afford them because they have made you poor intentionally. Right? Now, that's the job of this uh, 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old uh, people in charge of Nigeria. Okay? They destroyed education to the point that uh, they have to send their children abroad to go and get the better standard education that is better than what they are offering you back in Nigeria. Do you know the saddest thing? Now, they fail to invest in education in Nigeria, invest in educational infrastructures in Nigeria for the common man to at least be able to fend for himself or herself. One Nigeria denied that, destroyed all of that. Now, there are children that they are investing these uh, billions and billions of your money on to, to acquire education these children are not even coming back to Nigeria to add any value to Nigeria. They are coming back just like their parents to turn out to be leeches, scavengers, scroungers, leeches on the system. They ended up being, you know, more and more and more baggages for the rest of their lives because they feed fats from the same system without adding any value for real, right? That is what they gave in 22 years. So when you look at these people in their 50s and in their 60s, in their 70s and in their 80s, they are continuing to shout one Nigeria, one Nigeria. They have given to me a, a, an unsafe place. The, you know, Nigeria is now the second most terrorized people in the whole world. Now, Nigeria is also this place, uh, the second place where you have uh, the highest terrorism in the entire Africa. This is the legacy of the people in their 50s and in their 60s, in their 70s and in their 80s. They continue to tell you that you need to respect them because they probably have the best for you and me. They have the best of us in heart. They care about me. They care about our future. Now, you are in your 50s and in your 60s, okay? And you are telling people like us that we have no respect. We don't respect elders. We should bow down and then kiss their asses while they fritter away our future. You are complaining about our reaction. You are talking about us having no uh, kind of respect for people who have no respect for us. They built an economy that made us a poorer. Intentionally, they won't give you power. And the people that deny you power and put you in darkness, they are in their 50s, they are in their 60s, they are in their 70s, they are in their 80s. Yes, they are. So I ask, what is your inspiration that wants you to continue to keep this status quo as they are? What exactly is your inspiration? So that's why I'm now going to come down to those of us who are under 50. You see, let me tell you something. Even though Nigeria can take, up, can take our life anytime, mine, yours, any one of us, okay? And there are many ways that this happens. It depends on where you uh, or whether you want to admit it uh, or you don't want to. I personally believe that uh, if you see anybody in his 50s, in his 60s, 70s, or 80s and above, telling you that you don't know what you are talking about for asking that uh, this Nigeria should break up. If they say that to you, or if you see people in their 50s and in their 60s and above, Telling you that uh, there is nothing any of you can do. You all, you are all just noisemakers. Yeah, I mean, Tifnumbu is going to be your president. There's nothing you can do about it. And you see them again and say, Atiku is going to be your president. There's nothing you can do about it. You get what I mean now? And all these octogenarians and all that, right? I'm using these two octogenarians because 
they are those that uh, have uh, these people of uh, 50s, 60s, 70s behind them. And then uh, that's why I started with uh, the people in your 50s and in your 60s. Eh? You probably have been part of the whole Nigeria history. You have witnessed everything. You have lived long enough for you to at least, for once in your lives, be honest and sincere and tell the young ones that they are right. This country is not working. It's never going to work. You've seen it all. But when you turn around and you begin to mislead the younger people, you see, you can forgive. As told people, I said, we can forgive. We can forgive the young people who have failed to learn from their history. But what do we say to this man? What do we say to you in your 50s? And here you are. Eh? You saw Bokwari happened in, 20, I mean, in 1985. You witnessed that. You witnessed the Babangida. You witnessed all the killings that uh, followed. And in 2015, you became historians who continue to manipulate them. For what gain? Now, in seven years, right, more and more young people have been forced into poverty. You see, there is something that people don't know. And that's why I want to say this to those of you who are under 50. Some of you don't know how much of a, a setup Nigeria is. Are you with me? You have no idea of how much of a messed up it is. I'll tell you a little bit. When they talk about inflation, when they talk about poverty, when they talk about unemployment, so you get, do you know that the most people suffering from all of this are the young people? You. So when you see this Arubu or Joss, this Dabimoshe Das, who have seen Nigeria for what it is, for what it was, to what it is now, trying to bully you, blackmail you, manipulate you, or gaslight you. Me, I will tell you the picture so that you can now understand how much deep shit some of you young people are for you to be repeating whatever anybody above 50 is telling you about Nigeria. Me, I will tell you something and I pray it will make sense to you. Although, with the damages done by Nigeria, eh? Okay, if it no be food, it no make sense to them. For me, I will try and place it before you. You are going to agree with me. Now, that is because I'm going to use facts here. Yeah. You see all these killings in Nigeria? Eh? All this uh, uh, poverty number they are throwing about in Nigeria. All these things that every, 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 you know, all these terrible things happening in Nigeria, including the death. Do you know the victims, the, main, the major victims? They are the young, young people. You and me. So let's play with the numbers now. In Nigeria, it is on record, not scientifically proven, but it's on record that the population of Nigeria that is currently put at 205 million Maybe unreal, but whatever. Out of that population, 74%, 74% of that population, they are young people under the age of 30. They are not above, not above 30. Under. Imagine. So let me use rough estimates now. Let's say Nigeria is 200 million. 
Shebi, you know that 50% of uh, 200 million is 100 million, Abi. <laughs> we are talking about 74%, okay? Now, it remains 50%, 100 million, Abi. Now, cut that by, uh, what do you call it, uh, into, into two. What do you get? 25 million. Abi, how damn to the 100 million? Making it how many? How much? 120, 25 million. No, sorry. 150 million, rather. Now, remove 1 million or 2 million. Add them to that uh, remaining 50 million. That means, if you say 74%, roughly, what you are saying is that the population of Nigeria of 200 million, you can conveniently say 148, 147 million are people who are below 30. Under 30. Young. That's not all. They did their INEC registration online, offline, everything. They can't release the figure recently. So they said 13, I'm mean, sorry, about 13 million people completed their registration, INEC registration member. They did. Out of that 13 million, eh, they said over 70% again are young people below 30. That is to say about uh, 8 million of them. So I'm just playing with numbers now. Now, come back here. If they now say, uh, put it this way, if you have, uh, if they say, Nigeria has over 100 million people living in poverty. Who do you think take that chunk number? Who? Young people. How? Let me break it down. In Nigeria today, you will see a 30 years old man, 38 years old man, Still living with his parents, not because his parents were handicapped or anything, oh. but this is a young man, young woman. That if they should leave that house, they will become homeless. They cannot, they most of them are graduate, oh, educated, they are still being fed by their parents, they are still being clothed by their parents. Because of what Nigeria is. And you know that in this life, eh, everybody wants to everybody want to pretend that uh, they are coping. Because that's the point. Try and pretend to be coping. You have so many, many productive, able, sorry, you, you have so many able-bodied young men and women that are currently jobless, useless. Now, Whenever parents or guardian, whenever they fall into poverty or financial crisis, school fees of some of them, some of them will have to stop schooling. Yes. Some people, and that's how they, everybody begin to slide into poverty gradually, gradually. It doesn't happen in a day. When your parents and those who are funding you when they lose everything, then that means you, be, you, came, you are on your own. Nobody talks about the effect of uh, lost fortune, lost jobs, lost investment, and every other thing that Nigeria has done on so many people. People don't talk about them, the effect of that on their children. What you ended up hearing is that, uh, ah, mommy, wonder, mommy, wonder, if you know this man, if you know this... Uh, if you know their father, their father was a very, very great man when he was alive. He had an accident and he died and everything just changed. Now, look at them. That is what Nigeria is. And then you then have to see majority of them eh, having to live from shelter to shelter, having to live from hand to mouth, having to scavenge having to beg to survive, then they call it the experience, which will make them stronger. 
because uh, you know uh, if uh, if life doesn't teach you this how will you be stronger a system that continue eh, to destroy their self esteem poverty young young people if you go anywhere right now when they say young young people well i mean when you look at the population of those who have uh, fallen into the bracket of uh, drug abuse crime and so many others in nigeria today you have uh, them in their millions all thanks to this older generation that continue to say you have to respect them they took everything away from you they did and they are still doing it so when you see somebody in their 50s trying to question your reasoning faculty or your reasoning uh, capability and all that and they're telling you that uh, you don't understand how life work no you do what happened is that uh, you no longer want them to dictate how should you react when those who were supposed to be responsible for you that's their job to make a society more conducive more prosperous enough that opportunities are not uh, privatized opportunities are not uh, limited to those in their inner circles alone now they built this and they built us so they would never have to be the ones to tell you how to react that's the point you are young these older people who are still championing this one Nigeria, one Nigeria. It is the same old thing. You are going to become old soon and you're going to regret that uh, you wish you did, did, did take action uh, when you were younger. So the bottom line is this. If you are, if you are in your 50s, the question is, what thing they motivate you to continue to believe that the young people should listen to you? The young people should uh, uh, sort of a follow your full step. Your full steps, your greedy, I mean, your greedy, selfish, self centered uh, full step laced with your hypocrisy called respect has brought us here. And it's going to, it's going to get worse. So if you think that, uh, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is going to be a business as usual where we would have to keep uh, respecting people who have no respect for themselves, right? I'm going to advise you, if you're a young person, it is your right. It is your right to disrupt the entire system right now if you care about your future. Now, disrupting the system comes in different ways, all right? I have seen so many of you who are already doing, uh, you know, the uh, uh, political disruption, the Shores, the uh, Peter Obis, uh, and the rest of you will feel like uh, you could uh, do stage a political uh, revolution against them. I like that. Make them uncomfortable. They have ruined Nigeria. And then uh, everybody who is asking for a peace uh, of Nigeria today, in order for them to have their own peace, my brother, you have all the legitimacy to demand. You see this older generation. You see this, all these Akoshi bureaus. We call them Akoshi bureaus. They are old. They are in their 50s. They are in their 60s. They don't want to admit that they are failed, especially the generation that uh, should support, ordinarily should be their children. We are supposed to be the children of some of them. But these are failed uh, you know, people who would rather wait for you to join the queue and ended up eh, in the failure. If those who were in charge of Nigeria or especially Yoruba land in the 50s if they had been like all these uh, people who are in their 50s today, eh? if those ones were like them, many, many of us would probably, would probably be working on a, a slave plantation today. Because you see these ones, they don't care about anybody. They don't care about any future. And they will blame you for everything, even when they will be the one to deceive you, lie to you, tell you that they are doing it for you. They are not. So when you are done fighting them, you know the best, of, uh, the best you'll do is never to keep the, to keep the same contraption for them. Don't keep it together. You understand? Keeping it together is not for them. It's not for you. It is for them. Eh? Let the energy, let the energy lead you into taking and making that bold move. 
and you and I, we can hold hands for peace, prosperity, progress, eh? and development, eh? uh, and safety too. Uh, in every part of uh, Nigeria, we hold our hands and say, oh, yeah, may everybody they go in well. Don't, 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 don't get it uh, mixed up, okay? One of the things I like about, uh, I love about Shore is this. His way is a way that many people continue to misunderstood for their own reasons, because people can't say they misunderstood Shore per se. Shore said, if you understand this Nigeria, the owners of Nigeria, they are not keeping it for you or me. And at the same time, they don't want it to break up because of themselves. He said, every time you rise up and demand eh, for your rights, the reason why they will shoot you and kill you is because your right is the right that they are feeding on by taking it away from you. He also said, listen, everyone has the right to demand for self-rule, especially going back to our history as a people before they finally force us together as one, right? Shore said, oh, you see these rogues who have uh, managed to capture the levels of power in Nigeria, not for the people, but for themselves. They will kill anybody that want to take it away from them. They will, they will stage a civil war. They will start war. They will do anything. And he said this, years ago remember then he said he said if you want biafra if you want yoruba nation if you want the Kwarafa, if you want everybody to go their separate ways the first thing you do is to take that power away from these rogues because only them knows that when nigeria breaks you will not see all these uh all these uh you know billionaires without anything they are producing you will not see all these criminals looting you blind and at the same time offering themselves to you as your saviors right well people no one here are more she would have said if now revolution if now whatever is it going to be you cannot get what you want from this Nigeria. not now especially not now if you allow these people to keep that power so he was misunderstood peter b came they asked him peter b what are you going to do about uh this issue of division and all of that stuff, eh? especially restructuring. What do you what do you think? Peter B said, ah, I want a serious thing. Oh, all these things will take time. But in belief, say, if him begin to share the Nigerian uh, development accordingly, eh? everybody will be happy. And then uh, they will not need what they don't want to break away. So which means Peter B doesn't support the breakup of uh, Nigeria or as a politician, right? That is a tricky question, they will say. Well, because they are not, they are, they are dishonest people. They are dishonest. They will never give you a straight one, right? They asked Shetima, Shetima, what do you think? Restructuring where people can control their resources so that there will be less friction, less wahala. Everybody can be on their own. He said, restructuring my put. To hell with, to, to, to hell with restructuring. What is restructuring? Now, that is the future. It is not a future of unity. It is not a future of progress. It is not a future of development. It is a future of uh, strife, a future of uh, war, uh, you know, division, bloodbath. Just same thing Bokwari is offering you now. That's what I see. But I like it. I like uh, the, your own political disruption too. Anything that can uh, at least... Ah, anything that can at least end this, uh, you know, this 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 madness is welcome. Whatever is good, whatever is going to trigger it. That's why people like us are like, we know where this is presently. We know where it is going, and it is not the time to make yourselves as a young person eh, vulnerable enough to find yourself pushing these old rogues to continue to decide what your future will be like. I know it's so hard, though. It can be very tough. Eh? It can be very tough to, what do you call it? To reject, uh, to reject their money, especially with the level of poverty they have put many of you into. And I know so many of you are actually, you are like more pretending. Nobody should know that uh, you are struggling, but you are struggling. 
all these uh, people in their 50s and their 60s, they are struggling too, but they are comfortable with that suffering. You are a young person. Eh? I hope you won't have to make them uh, bully you to silence uh, on your choices. I choose Yoruba nation. Now we continue to stand by that. But apart from that, I am pro Yoruba, which is Yoruba first. If those criminals who continue to take advantage of our, uh, uh, what do you call it, of, of our, of our uh, patience, so to say, uh, sooner or later, eh, there is something coming. I strongly believe too. So there is a chapter of this uh, book I'm going to try and read to you some other time, maybe later tonight, where we, we're going to talk about uh, the Yoruba security. It spoke about Yoruba security, the bravery, the Yoruba's uh, battles among ourselves, among those who tried to invade us uh, way back then, uh, you know, to establish sovereignty, to establish authority, to establish a respect, which many, many of the politicians today are trading off, uh, you know, on a platter, uh, on, a, on a plate of uh, porridge. So if you are looking for the book, I think it's 10 now, it's 10 pounds. So it's called, I mean, it is from the captivating uh, history, the Yoruba people. You can get that if you want to. Read up some interesting stuff there, including Yoruba's, uh, you know, Yoruba's, uh, Yoruba's uh, interpretation of uh, the beginning of man. Do you understand that now? So uh, our own, uh, our own uh, analogy, or should I say, our own uh, mythology about creation, Yoruba's from our own history, many, many, right? You know, in the Bible, they told you about, they told you about uh, Adams and Eve. And then uh, in the Quran, they told you about uh, uh, Adam and uh, Awawu. Adam what Awawu, Abi. So Yorubas, we have our own history too, about uh, creation. Some of them, uh, you know, it's quite uh, intriguing. And then uh, some can be very, very, uh, you know. So account of creation, make I read that one to you. It said, see this all. It said that uh, Yoruba culture is primarily horror, which means history was passed down through stories, legends, and folklore. In the Yoruba culture, the families responsible for telling the stories had to be appointed by the king. And the role of historian was inherited by the family member who received the most training or knew the most stories. As to be expected, the stories vary. Mm -hmm. As they, they tell the story, it will change. This is where you get to hear the story of Odudua. Do you get that now? The story of Odudua. Account, different accounts. Now, listen to this one. They said, just as the scientific world as a widely accepted theory of creation, the Big Bang. Yeah? Uh, the Yorubas have their own account of creation. We do. Although it is probably more accurate to say account, since there is more than one accepted, I mean, acceptable or let's say accepted the version. The, excuse me. The first and most widely popular account of creation is told as follows, okay? In the beginning, the whole universe was made up of the sky above and water below. The entire surface of the earth was covered in water. Olodumari, the king of the heavens and the supreme being, sent down some divine beings to establish life on earth. This is how God created the world or created earth. In Yoruba's account, there are many way to. While preparing for this journey, Olodumare gave them one chicken, a calabash, a type of a god, right? Containing sand and one palm knot. These heavenly beings descended to earth by a chain and landed on the spot known as Ife. 
which is regarded as the art of Yoruba land. Ile ife ni orisun. So you know the story. The heavenly beings pour the sand on the surface of the water and place the chicken on it. As the chicken began to scratch the sand with its claws, the sand began to spread until it formed the islands and continents of the whole world. That's our story. Uh, no, 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 sorry. That's one version. Another account of this story states that the heavenly beings sent from by Olodumari, right, they came with chameleon. And as the fowl spread the sand over the hearth, the chameleon determined if the sand, if the land was dry and solid enough. It is also believed that the areas still covered with water are those places not touched by the sand. The heavenly beings planted the palm nuts and it grew into the plants we have today. The human race was said to have descended from the heavenly beings where it all started in Ileife. The creation account implies that the Yorubas were the first humans and that other humans and civilizations originated from Ileife. That's another account. There is more. Another notable creation story, eh, similar to the one above, states that when Odudua, popularly known as the father of Yoruba land, was sent to create humankind, he was given a chicken and a bag of sand. As he descended down a long chain, he lost grip on the chicken. While attempting to catch the chicken, he lost grip on the bag of sand. So the sand plummeted. And by the time Odudua recovered, the sand had already formed a mold. With the chicken seated on it, the sand started expanding. And he, ex he exclaimed, Odudua exclaimed, and he said, Ha, ile unfe, meaning the land is expanding. That is why we have ile ife today. There is also another one, which is also slightly different. So there is a, another slightly different creation account states that Olodumare sent a group of heavenly beings on an expedition. According to this account, Olodumare made Obatala the leader of this expedition. But along the way, Obatala got drunk and fell into a drunken stupor. Due to this, Odudua had to take over the expedition and he subsequently completed the mission, thus making him the father of the Yoruba people and all the people of the world. There is also another version. They say, another version says that the Yorubas migrated from Mecca and were descendants of Lamurudu, one of the kings of Mecca. One of Lamurudu's offspring is Odudua. This particular one is a lie, but it's also a version that they have told people before. They even did a movie. They did a movie. This version is a pure lie that those who were like uh, the Islamic uh, Islamic scholar back then in Yoruba land, they were the ones who smuggled this lie into Yoruba history. But this is what they wrote. I'll read it to you. It doesn't make any sense. It never made any sense. So tomorrow, it, uh, you know, Yorubas, Yorubas have nothing to do with Arabs. Nothing at all. All the Yoruba tribes that we have, we have no relationship with uh, uh, Mecca or Saudi Arabia or anywhere Arab live. We don't have anything to do with them. All right? But they brought this lie. So I'll read it again. They said, Yorubas migrated from Mecca and were descended from Lamurudu, one of the kings of Mecca. 
There is no history record in Mecca of anybody called Lamurudu, by the way. No history, no nothing. No historians know anything about Lamurudu or anybody said anything about Lamurudu. Lie, okay? So they said, one of Lamurudu's offspring, Odudua, is, who is the ancestor of the Yoruba people. However, this version did not state the period. Yeah? The period when Lamurudu was in power in Mecca. No time. But it talks about the revolution among his descendants and their dispersion. During this period, the crown prince, Odudua, wanted to change the state religion to idolatry in Mecca. They even did a movie. Oh, ah, cha, 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 cha. Oh, well, can you hear them pain, Misha? Man, we need to educate our people. We need to educate ourselves, honestly. So they said during this period, the crown prince, Odudua, was to, wanted to change the state religion to idolatry. So he, he turned the mosque into a temple for idol worship. He had a chief priest called Asara, who himself was an idol maker. Asara had a son named Brahima, <laughs> who as a child detested his father's profession. He grew up to become a follower of Muhammad. The founder, the founder of Islam. So what they are saying is that eh, Odudua left Mecca before they gave birth to Muhammad because the son of uh, the person, the son of the person who was uh, carving an uh, idol for Odudua in Mecca, gave birth to, I'm sorry, the son of one of the person who make an uh, idol for him was following Muhammad. Uh, you see how they, they you see how people doctor history, eh? It is well. Anyway, they said he had a, I mean, sorry, uh, while he helped his father sell some of the carved images, he wasn't a willing participant. So the town frequently went on three-day hunting expedition to celebrate the gods. So Brahma used a <laughs> young <more> Brahma. <laughs> So you, uh, princess, princess who, she you the hear her now, eh? All of you, Omo Brahimo, they say you be Omo Brahimo. Oh, do do a, we carry, we carry, uh, we carry this from Mecca, come, come Nigeria. Afar, all this are far from Osho. I them they tell that kind of story. I them write all this nonsense. But we will teach our children because they don't make any sense. You know they don't make any sense, right? So they say Brahimo use one of the occasion, one of these occasions to destroy the gods in the temple, since those that might, op might oppose him were out of town. When the expedition party returned and discovered what Brahimo had done, he was ordered to be burned alive. This led to a war between the followers of the gods and the Muslims in Mecca. The Muslims won the war, and Lamurudu was killed. His children, and their sympathizers were driven out of Mecca. Odudua and his children escaped with two idols, and they journeyed eastward for 90 days until they reached the Leife, where they settled. Ileife is another name for the aforementioned Ile I mean, Ife is an aforementioned Ileife. She do not make any sense. Now, so then try use religion or retell our story or. Person go walk out from Mecca, Saudi Arabia. You go come reach Ilefe in 90 days. Um, you know that Zobo? You hear that Zobo? Very, very insulting. So considering the manners and customs, it is undeniable that the Yorubas migrated from the East. She makes make sense. Does that make any sense? Listen to this. Oh. Odudua was running away from his brothers and sisters. According to this folklore, lie -o. So some Muslims wanted to kill him. So he came to Ilefe, which means there were people already in Ilefe, Abi, when Odudua came. That means there were already there were people in Yoruba land before Odudua came. Abi, I'll tell you something. That seems to be the plausible story. I don't know where Odudua came from. There was so many, so many cook up lies about that. But the plausible one is that. When he came to Yoruba land, he met the people. Like every migrant, we all migrated from somewhere, didn't we? Yeah, our forebearers, they migrated from, from somewhere, right? 
So they said when Odudua came, it was welcomed, like our culture as Yoruba people. It was made to feel at home, right? From the process, he even married. Then he became, uh, uh, what do they call her? A babalawo that uh, eventually offered a great help to the town back then, to the point that uh, it was made the chief, uh, the chief uh, priest of the town. That's the plausible story. That all to do a work from heaven. Baba live story, Jare. We wish, wish, we know the, we know the 1860. I mean, we know the, we know the 11th century anymore. All those things don't make any sense anymore. Okay. Oh, he came from heaven with this. Oh, he walked in Waka 90 days from Mecca. Uh, Yoruba's from the, no, 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 no. Those are bullshit. But they put them down. And I love the way they analyze them in this book, right? They make you see that uh, there are versions. Okay. But there are truth as well. Listen to this. They said, after Odudu was settled in Ileife, which means he remarried. So when he settled, then he gave birth to a son. A son named Okobi. Okobi had seven children who will later establish the different kingdoms that make up some of the Yoruba lands today. The names of the princes and princesses are Owu, Onogun, Popo, Sabe, Ketu, Oyo, and Bini. Odudua also had a grandson named Oronyo, who will later establish one of the biggest Yoruba empires. Despite all of this varying, I mean, varying uh, creation accounts, there is no doubt that the Yorubas regard Odudua as their founding and spiritual father. Odudua was our spiritual father because of the role he played eh, in our history. Odudua did not found Yoruba land. When Odudua came to Yoruba land, he met Yorubas in Yoruba land. He met us there where we are. That is the history. Do you understand that now? That is what you must tell your children. So now me, let me tell you about this. Some people are feeling like Bini care. We think because I'm Bini. You see what they talk about education. You see that Bini kingdom is one of the Yoruba kingdoms. In fact, eh, from history, which even the Bini will confirm, and they have always, they've never denied that, right? Is that... Uh, one of the children of uh, Okobi became. It doesn't mean that, uh, or uh, what do you call it? It doesn't mean that. Uh, let me put it straight. It's not. It's not that uh, somebody came and then uh, they come and just like they told the story of Odudua. Okay, there have always been people there in what is a Bene kingdom. But the person who actually became the king there was uh, a son to Okobi. Do you get that now? Or Kobi? That is why till tomorrow, Bini and Ileife, the source, Bini will always tell you that Ileife is their source. If you are from Bini, you will know this. But you know the Bini you have today, Edo State that you have today. Not be everybody where the Edo be Bini. Sure you know. Do you know? Well, I bet you know. Sorry. Maybe I shouldn't be asking. But if you are not from Bini State, eh? I mean, if you are not from Edo State, do you know that... Eh, Bini, which is the big, I mean, the largest uh, uh, ethnic uh, uh, group uh, in uh, in Edo states. No, be only. So, if we say Bini Yoruba, if you are from Edo state, you know, suppose they take offense, okay? And if you are a Bini yourself, eh? No, they take offense because you know you are a Yoruba. You know it. Yes. Anyway, there are origins, you know, origins of tribes in Yoruba land. Yeah, origins of tribes in Yoruba land, according to this. They said Yoruba, Yoru, they said Yoruba might be one large ethnic group, but there are many tribes within the culture that, in one way or another, can trace their origins to Odudua and city of Ileife. Do you get that now? Eh? Obviously, all of us say we be we be all my or anything, but there is something from the ancients, right? That linked all of us back there. Okay. 
the other day. I mean, we, and when we say Yoruba, Yoruba is uh, the conglomeration of other tribes who have something in common, language. But despite that, even our languages are also kind of uh, different too. Hmm? But we have tribes, eh? as I said earlier, most of the major tribes sprang from Odudua's grandchildren. Okay? All of other minor tribes originated from one of these seven tribes. Ketu, Owu, Sabe, Orogun, Ila, Popo, and Bene. When Odudua migrated from the east, there is a possibility that the eastern region contained natives who were conquered and absorbed into the culture. Because, you know, I told you, Yorubas historically, now, you know, war, fight, this, that. So when we fight war on another village, on another community, who have their own uh, culture, tribe, and everything, what, would they, what were they doing? When they, when they conquer them, they bring them to different, uh, you know, communities. That's how we build this Yoruba culture you are seeing today. But people never lost uh, who they were. Do you understand that? They never lost who they were. Right. So they said... Yoruba culture, the Yoruba culture established and extended their kingdom as far as Ashanti, Ghana, because Oronyo and his brother were able to push their conquest in every direction. Yorubas pushed their conquest war to Dahomey. There were people in Dahomey. Dahomey was conquered by war. Yorubas warriors who are descendants and children of Odudua. Do you get that now? And there's, there's always there's always historical record to that till tomorrow. So, for example, Oyo, Oronyo is known as the founder of the Oyo Empire. He was the youngest among the seven grandchildren of Odudua. Before he departed from Ileife, Oronyo was already a distinguished and brave warrior. This is probably one of the reasons why he became successful in this in his conquest. Back then, you have to be a warrior. For you to be a king. So Dudua sent his children, trained them as warriors, to go everywhere. There were Yorubas already. To lead them, including Oyo. So, Oronyo, they said this is, a, well, they said according to one account, Oronyo agreed, which is Oromiyo. I will use Oromiyo. Oromiyo agreed with his brother to attack a northern kingdom that had insulted his grandfather. Another version, another version of the event said, Oromiyo left on an expedition to Mecca to avenge the death of his grandfather. That's another bullshit, by the way. So let's go on. On the way, the two brothers quarreled and split up, going their separate ways. Oromiyo wandered south to, Bas to Busa, where a chief, where a chief there extended his hospitality. After explaining his predicament to the chief, Oromiyo was given a charmed snake. As instructed, Oromiyo followed the snake for seven days until it arrived at a spot and vanished into the ground. There, Oromiyo established the Oyo Empire. While the city was still under construction, they were constantly attacked by the Bariba of Bogu, who wanted to dominate the new city. At this point, the warrior Ajagunla also known as Onogun, one of the legendary grandsons of Odudua, stepped in and helped the newly found city win the war. Not long after this, Onomiyo had a son named Ajunwo Ajaka. Much later, he gave birth to another son known as Shongo. Onomiyo became the first Oba, the ruler of Oyo Empire, and Shongo, known as the Thunder God, became the third king. The empire no longer exists today. Oyo Katunda, how many of you remember that? The current Oyo, the current Oyo that you have today is not the real Oyo. The whole Oyo was destroyed by the Fulani from Bogu. How many of you remember that? Anyway, don't worry. The land is still there in Yoruba land though. They eventually they reconquered it, but they had to go and build another Oyo empire. Fulani. Right. So they said, uh, Oromiyo, yeah, okay, I've read that. Uh, the current Alafi, or the old Alafi is dead now. I didn't hear me Alafi. 
they said that uh, the empire no longer exists today, though there is still a ruler over the city of Odo, I mean Odo, who claims ancestry to Oromia, the current uh, or the emperor. Then later laughing, uh, spoke about that. Now here is another part of the Jebus. This one of my own parts. So let's see, let's see what the history said about the Jebus during the Odu era. The Jebus have different accounts of their origin. Of course, I'm an Ijebu man. That's why I don't, you know, I don't, I don't always believe the version there, right? By the way, so one version says that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, I mean, the Ijebus descended from a victim who had been offered for sacrifice by the king of Beni to the god of the ocean. Um, you know, your story, history, oh. They said one version, oh, one version of who are the Ijebus. They said, started from, uh, you know, that Ijebus de descended from a victim who had been offered for sacrifice by the kings of uh, Bini to the god of the ocean. However, another account claims that the Ijebus were descendant, I mean, descended uh, or descendants from Obanta. That is our true story, by the way. We are the Omo Obanta. Obanta himself was also a warrior. And then, uh, you know, a Babalawo. Back then, you needed to be a warrior to lead the people. Most of the time, people are always being attacked, captured, enslaved, and all of that. So somebody will come and say, hey, I'm putting an end to it. I will be your leader. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's it. That's the end. That's the history, Beth. Obanta is uh, the fathers of the Jebus. That's why Jebus will likely not uh, agree to all the account of uh, Odudua dropping from heaven or coming from Mecca, all those stuff. They are not appealing to us as Ijebus. And we are Yorubas. Mm -hmm. Now, listen to this. They said that uh, who was offered, okay. They said after being left for dead, he revived and crawled into the bush. Listen, they said Ijebus descended from Obanta, right? Uh, so, who, <laughs> this, again, this one is sacrifice. Who was offered as a, as a human sacrifice by the king of Uwu? After being left for dead, he revived and crawled into the bush where he survived on fruit before later dabbling in farming. It is worth noting that in both accounts, the founders were victims of human sacrifice. Another account claims that Obanta led people out of Ileife to form Ijebu Ode. He led them until he reached old age, at which point he was instructed by Ifa the chief god and the god of divination to live and die outside of the town. The king of the Jebus are known as Awujale and the current Awujale is Obadetono. In Ondo, talking about tribes in Yoruba land now, they said the killings of twins was a prevalent practice among the early Yoruba people. And somehow, this practice is what brought about the establishment, I mean, establishment of the Ondo kingdom. One of the wives of the Oyo Empire, sorry, one of the wives of the Oyo Empire birthed twins in an era when twins were considered an abomination. The Alafi Oluasho, Oluasho was not happy about this and ordered them removed from the kingdom. The princess left with a number of friends and journeyed to the present site of Ondo, meaning settler. So Ondo, Ado, Ondo, Odo. So one of the twins died at Ekwe which was near Ondo, the other twin, Airo, would later become the Oshemawe of Ondo. The current Oshemawe is Kiladejo. I don't know if he's still. Then the Egba people in Yoruba land. The Egba people established their homeland in the Egba forest. After migrating from Oyo, most families in Egba can trace their ancestry to Oyo. Hence, the popular saying, Egbas who do not have or your roots must be slaves. This means that if they could not trace their roots, they must have belonged to the early Egba people who were conquered by the settlers. Over the century, the Egba people evolved from small hamlets to villages and are now cities which operate independently. The first Alaki of Egba, Okukenu, Shagbua, and the current one, Aremugbadebo. The Ekiti people in Yoruba, the Ekiti tribe, the Ekiti people are among the original inhabitants of the uh, country absorbed 
by Odudua when he migrated from Mecca. Ekiti means mold, you know. I'm sorry, mound, which is derived from the mountainous features of the area. The region has extensive vegetation and is very watered. One account says the Ekiti people are descended from so it is Ekiti people, Ekiti people are descended from one of the offsprings of Odudua, Olofi. One of Odudua's offspring had 16 children of his own. Olofin decided to venture from Ife in search of greener pastures. Olofin and his offspring journeyed until they reached flat terrain. Two of his children decided to stay behind while the rest of the family continued their journey until they reached a land with many eels. Thus, they named the place Ile, I mean Ile Olokiti or Ile Olokiti. A land with many, many eels. Thus, yeah. So the Ekiti kingdom was divided into several kingdoms over time. Today, Ekiti is one of the states that comprises, you know, that's part of Nigeria. Then you have the Ijesha people of Yoruba land. The Ijeshas have different origin stories because their founder was different from the present day people. The first account relates to the earliest Yoruba people when they had just migrated from the east and subdued the natives. At this time, human sacrifices were common and slaves were often used as the victims. Slaves were captured from a district called Obokun and treated like cattle to be sacrificed to the gods. This prompted the name Ije Orisha, meaning food for the gods. Another account says the present-day Jesha ate from Ekiti. According to the customs back then, they were to go on a three-month hunting expedition for their king every, I mean, every year. On one such expedition, they found a region with plenty game and an agreeable climate. The native Ijesha, probably a remnant of the former speci I mean, uh, sacrificial victim, was peaceful. However, these people were quickly subdued by, invader, by the invaders. One of their chiefs was feared due to his kind and gentle nature. He quickly rose through the ranks and eventually became the second in command to the chiefs of the invaders. The current Oba of Ijesha land, eh? Oba Akinkunle Aromo, Aromo Laro. There are so much. The politics, Yoruba politics, the politics of your early Yoruba kingdom, that too is so interesting. It's part of it. I will read some of them to you some other time, okay? Thank you so much for spending your, uh, your morning or afternoon with me. I'm going to be back later this evening, possibly. And if you have the time, you can join. That's when we have all our blockbusters, usual, okay? So uh, stay safe and good afternoon.